There we go. Okay. So we uh so what what I was saying, and you're gonna get two recordings for this because it just cut me off on the internet, but we are just going to say here, what are we going to teach the family about hemolytic uremic syndrome, which we're, we were on, is teach the family to avoid undercooked meat, hmm, probably because of E. coli too, especially ground beef, uh, internal temperature of meat should be at least 74 degrees Celsius or 165 Fahrenheit. You know what's weird about that is it's six months to four years. I don't know if a six month old is going to eat meat, but Avoid unpasteurized apple juice and unwashed raw vegetables. Avoid alfalfa sprouts. Avoid public pools. Do not use an anti-motility medicines for diarrhea. Oh, there mean that means let them go ahead and have the diarrhea to get rid of whatever is causing it. Probably just give them some supportive fluids, right? Okay, let's go over acute renal failure. And I'm crossing my fingers my internet stays good. Uh, Acute renal failure is a little bit different than acute glomerul nephritis. We know glomerul nephritis is caused by strep, but uh, is the inability of the kidneys to excrete waste material, concentrate urine, and conserve electrolytes? The disorder can be acute or chronic, affects most systems of the body. Causes are classified as pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal. Now, this is, uh, so, if we were to say, hang on, let me see if I can find a picture. We're going to do a picture of, uh, this has got a pre renal, uh, a pre -renal um, and I'm going to put interrenal and post renal. Let's see if it will give me a picture for all of these. Okay. So hmm, let's look view together here. And there should be, okay. I like this picture. I like this one. So when you're looking at pre-renal and then they've got renal, like which is uh, is the one they were talking about is this one right here, uh, intrinsic renal. They use intrinsic renal instead of intrarenal. And then we got post-renal. And what that means is pre-renal, when you think of it, I want you to think of blood flow going into the kidney. So it's coming from the body, going into the kidney. And there may be a pre-renal issue, keeping blood flow from entering into the kidney. When you have intrinsic renal, that means something inside of the kidney is going wrong. And when you have post-renal, it means something after the kidney. That's why I wanted to show you a picture because I feel like it will help you to understand it a little bit better. And so you see here, it says classified as pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal. And this is the most common cause of acute renal failure. So really what they're wanting you to do is see pre-renal. And pre-renal has to do with blood flow or volume going into the kidney. Dehydration, maybe because of diarrhea or vomiting, uh, surgical shock and trauma. So, you know, when you go to that comp complex care where you're talking about shock and where you're talking about low blood volume, guess what? You could possibly have a pre-renal issue. Uh, accidental poisoning, didn't know that, or prolonged anesthesia hmm, could cause it. Intrinsic renal is damage to the glomerulus, tubules, or renal vasculature, so something in the kidney itself, uh, an obstruction, or it's, it says it could be cause a post-renal issue, right? So, and there's damage to the kidney, it could cause something to be post-renal. So oligouria um, in acute renal failure is reversible if we can treat the cause. We have to figure out, is this a pre-renal issue, an intrinsic renal issue, or a post-renal issue? Um, abrupt diuresis with return to normal urine volumes. Look, edema, drowsiness, circulatory collapse, cardiac arrhythmias. So think about it. Acute renal failure, they're going to have some hyperkalemia. Seizures from low salt, low calcium. I would write this down for acute renal failure. All right. And then look, tachypnea from metabolic acidosis. Ooh, I think I would write all of those down. I think I would write oligouria is reversible, right? Acute renal failure or anything acute glomerulonephritis can be reversed if we catch it in time. 
So it says central nervous system manifestations from continued oviduria, which is very little urine. So let's look at our labs. And I'm going to just tell you with acute renal failure, here's the thing. If you were to go into, let's say the ER and you had some kidney problem, they're trying to figure out which one of these problems you have. They're probably going to run a bunch of labs. Look at all the labs that are off here. We got hyperkalemia. We got hyponatremia. We got metabolic acidosis. That's very odd. We got hypocalcemia. Remember, because our phosphorus is probably high. Anemia, which is similar to the one we saw before. Azotemia, which means what? Oh, the bun and creatinine are up. That's what that means. Okay. Elevated phosphorus, elevated plasma creatinine, and elevated bun. Obviously, they say azotemia, but creatinine and bun there. And then ECG for cardiac arrhythmias because of the potassium. And then um, they may do what's called an intravenous polygram, which is an IVP or an MRI. And what they do is they run dye through the kidney to see what's going on, see what's functioning. I definitely think you're going to have to know the labs here, okay? So let's look what we're going to do. We're going to treat the underlying cause. If it's blood flow to the kidney, we may have to give them volume, right? If it's something interrenal, it could be a medication that's causing uh, some, some problems inside the kidney. So we'll stop the medication. Um, but if you look, uh, maintain neutral temperature, central venous pressure, urinary cath, assess for behavior changes. Really not a lot different here under nursing care. Looks exactly the same. The thing is, you got to know what you're looking at and, and what labs you're going to see. Now, with acute renal failure, we might even add on some mannitol, right, to pull some fluid off. Uh, remember, furosemide is the one for renal failure, but mannitol can also be used in an emergency situation. Calcium gluconate, why would we give calcium? Y'all still there? Hyperkalemia or if they have low calcium? Yeah, because they're having hypokalemia, right? They're ha or So do we have, look here, let's see what it said about the calcium. Low calcium, remember in, in renal failure, calcium is usually low and phosphorus is usually high. Mm -hmm. So we might have to give some calcium. If we do give calcium, what happens to the phosphorus? It goes along. Yeah, it goes down. Uh, so bicarb, what do we give that for? The acidosis. Yes, very good, very good. And then glucose and insulin causes uh, it causes glucose and potassium to move into the cell. So it will also help with the high potassium. And it says insulin facilitates entry of glucose into the cell, helps to reduce blood potassium levels. So insulin might be necessary, but you remember you have to give glucose with it. Why are we going to give sodium polycystrine sulfonate to this person? To excrete the potassium if they have too much. Yes. So if, it, you know, there's two ways we can get rid of it. We could do insulin with glucose or we could do sodium polycystrine. Um, why are we going to give uh, labetalol to a patient of acute renal failure? Hypertension. Is blood pressure. Yeah, blood pressure, very good. And look at some other ones, hydrolazine, clonidine, verapamil, which is an acin, or, or that, this is a calcium channel blocker, sorry. And then catapril, that's an ACE inhibitor, hydrolazine, minoxidil, propanolol. Look at, they can all be given for hypertension. So be aware of what meds are hypertensive meds, right? So this is telling me, when I look at this, I say, okay, you got to know what your labs are here in order to know what are you going to give. I'm gonna say focus right there because that's gonna be really important. And I've seen these uh, renal questions are not easy, okay? Dialysis is continued. Um, it could be, and it can be required to correct hyperkalemia too. Um, nutrition, um, let's see. Uh, I don't wanna repeat everything. Let's see, support the child and the family, adequate rest. Hmm, okay. All I see here is this. I see acute renal failure, pre-renal, intrinsic renal, post-renal. What does it look like with the labs? Okay. 
what are you going to do for this person? You're going to do the same nursing care for all of these, probably daily way. You guys know all the, the drill. We don't need to go over it, but pay attention to what we're going to treat this patient with. And then we have, of course, like this is, uh, do we have chronic renal failure on there? Let's see. Yep. Chronic renal failure is on there. So let's go through it and see uh, chronic renal failure or insufficiency begins with uh, the diseased kidneys can no longer maintain the normal chemical structure. So chronic means it's going to be a long-term issue and you're probably going to have to know the labs. It says the, um, it says, uh, let me read this. They can no longer maintain the normal chemical structure of the body fluids under normal conditions. And there is extensive irreversible damage to the nephrons. So are we going to get, or is this going to reverse? Oh. No. And look, a variety of diseases can, and disorders can lead to this. Uh, let me ask you something. All those diseases we talked about probably could be reversed, but could they lead to a chronic renal failure? Yes. Yes, you're exactly right. So look, most common causes before five years of age are congenital renal and urinary tract malformations. So maybe something's wrong in the kidney, you know, uh, glomeral and hereditary renal disease, uh, predominantly in the five to 15 year old age group. Let's look at what chronic looks like. And really what you're going to see here is probably a lot of labs, but what you don't know, first of all, we didn't, it, it's kind of backwards, I think, because what you really need to know is what does the kidney do in order to know that when the kidney doesn't do it, what do you see, right? And so I'm going to try to point out some things here. Loss of energy and increased fatigue and maybe even some pallor. The kidneys are responsible for making erythropoietin to create red blood cells. If the kidneys don't work, we're not going to have very good red blood cells or oxygen carrying capacity. So the person's going to be tired. They're going to be anemic. They're going to be fatigued. Um, the kidneys also control blood pressure and our blood pressure will start to sneak up. Delayed growth, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, uh, decreased interest in activities, decreased or increased urinary output and compensatory increase in fluid intake. Let's see here. Uh, they're going to get what's called a uremic odor to their breath. Uh, it smells a little bit like urea. Headache, muscle cramps, uh, weight loss, puffiness to the face, malaise. This is different. Bone or joint pain, itchy or bruised skin. Now, this is interesting. Uh, usually with a liver problem, patients will get itchy. But in chronic renal failure, they can also get itchy skin because, does anybody know why? Do, if anybody know why? It's the buildup of like the... I don't know, crap, not the crap, but just the buildup of waste and toxins in your body you, is going to come out through your skin. That's right. It's called uremic frost. Mm -hmm. And when you can't get rid of your urine as good, it'll build up with like a little crystals on the surface of the skin cause really itchy. Um, it might even cause amenorrhea in adolescent girls where no period, right? And especially circulatory overload and maybe some neuro involvement. This is a huge deal, right? So let's look at our labs. We'll just know what is up and what is down in uh, kidney failure. Hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, anemia, bun and creatinine, arterial blood gases like metabolic acidosis. Huh, let's go over here. Is that That's pretty short. Look at that. That's pretty short right here. Look over here. This one was pretty long. Maybe it is kind of the same, uh, but this one is more ECG. You know what? If your potassium was high, would you put an ECG on everybody? Yes, Could you would. Put their heart. There you go. Yes, you would. Great. So keep, you know, use your nurse sense when you're on this test. Um, I think these are all the same. I'm not going to go over them unless I see something that is different. It, they may need dialysis. They probably will on chronic renal failure. Um, look at this one is a little different. They might do thiazides or furosemide for hypertension. Huh. 
beta blockers and vasodilators for severe hypertension, phosphorus binding agents to get rid of the phosphorus, calcium supplements. Why? Let me ask you, why vitamin D? Because vitamin D is hand in hand with calcium, correct? That is correct. That's correct. What else? Did you know that the kidneys play a role in uh, vitamin D production? The mm -hmm. liver, do, the kidneys do also. So, um, you know what? Calcium is low, vitamin D is low in a renal patient. Uh, our water soluble vitamins are going to be kind of low because we're going to be running out. We need sodium bicarb to correct the acidosis. We might even need some folic acid and some erythropoietin for our red blood cells. This person may get some erythropoietin. And then we may need uh, some recumbent growth hormone. I didn't know that. Uh, antimicrobials for infection, antileptics for seizures, dephenhydramine for the itching, and then packed red blood cells to, co to correct anemia and administer slow. This has a lot of corrections here. Um, when you really look at the things that the kidney does, let's see if a, hang on, let's see. There may be a picture, and if a picture of the things, because, let's see if it, if it gives you a list. Uh, we used to have a really good list, or I used to have a really good one, hmm. and it would list it straight down. I don't see it on here. Um, I wish they TI did it like that so you could see the things that the kidney actually does, but they play a role in so many things in the body. So let's look at our nutrition. Uh, goal, adequate nutrition and protein for growth. Dietary restrictions of phosphorus because it's too high and be care careful of potassium and limit your protein, right? They may also with this need folic acid and iron. So be aware of that. Um, Complications. So this is a complication here in stage renal disease. Um, if we have chronic kidney disease, they're not going through the whole process, but how do you know you're having it? It goes down in stages and, and they don't show it on here. But as you go down stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, whatever, the glomerular filtration rate slowly drops down as you go into renal, you know, severe renal failure. And so be aware that the glomerular filtration rate will drop. So let's see what we got here. Let's see what we know just off the top of our head by going over it. A nurse is assessing a child who has nephrotic syndrome. Which of the following findings should the nurse expect? A. A. Hmm. See how tricky this is going to be? Is um is nephrotic syndrome have lipidemia? That's cholesterol, right? It's cholesterol. I think they do. Let's look. Let, since everybody's like, okay, I, I think I don't know. Let's go down here and I want you to make sure you have this under nephrotic syndrome. Okay. They will have protein in their urine, which is that said plus two, right? A client who has nephrotic syndrome will exhibit edema in the ankles due to decreasing colloidal osmotic pressure. So more in the ankles. A client who has nephrotic syndrome will have hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and then will exhibit anorexia due to the edema of the intestinal mucosa. Hmm. A client who has nephrotic syndrome will exhibit decreased urine output. That is not, or they will exhibit decreased urine output they won't have increased urine output or polyuria. So they'll have oguria or anuria, right? I know those are a lot of words. This, this section is kind of hard. Uh, a nurse is caring for a school-aged child who has acute glomerular nephritis. Which of the following findings should the nurse report to the provider? Probably the... That bun is kind of a creatinine. Oh, never mind. I'm looking at three. Never mind. The creatinine is 1.3. That's kind of concerning, right? Because it it's out of range. Y'all help her out. I say it's creatinine, but the bun is supposed to be 10 to 20, but the creatinine is 1.3. 
That's out of range. Mm. I put mine in. I'm out. Okay, what do y'all think? I'm doing the math on the urine because I can't do it in my head. I'm going to tell you that's low. Yeah, so I'd say at least D. I probably D. Yeah, y'all better pick up on your output because, okay, let's make sure we know. A normal bun is what? What's the range? 10 to 20. 10 to 20, but in your book in the AT, I think it says 7 to 20. So yeah. that would be a normal bun, right? And it's not high either. It would be low. Uh, creatinine is like 0 0.7 to 1.4, somewhere in there. That falls in range. Blood pressure is not high. It's it's kind of low, but it's not bad. But the output is low. And um, I would definitely brush up. Oh, what? I just didn't know if that was the um, output was low for a kid. Oh, yeah. When I was ah. looking at when I was looking at this, I was like, it's D because I was yeah, talking it. about a child. Exactly. <laughs> And we're talking about a child. Same outfit as <laughs> I, I wouldn't. Oh, uh, you guys see? Okay, wait. Let's look at blood creatinine. One point three is above the expected range for a child. Mm -hmm. We might have to go back and look at the lab on that for a child, because an uh, an adult is zero point six to one point four or something like that. So apparently, this is probably above normal for a child. I kept forgetting we're looking at a child. Mm -hmm. very good very good okay a uh, nurse is caring for a preschooler who has nephrotic syndrome which of the following findings should the nurse report to the provider wow they're giving y'all labs on this Too bad I don't have the cricket sound. <laughs> you might as well uh, just scroll on down. Right, let's scroll on down. Let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a child. So let's look. Okay. The, the Percy. This five is out of the expected range. I wish they would put the normal range down here, don't you? In the mm -hmm. rationale. But it might have been too hard for them to top it out. All right. Uh, a nurse is assessing a child who has chronic renal failure. Which of the following findings should the nurse expect? Um, weight gain because they've weight got so. yeah could be could be a delayed growth too <gasps> oh it is delayed growth okay let's go back and look at it let's go back and look it's there. which of the following five should the nurse expect mm -hmm. yeah delayed mm -hmm. growth. maybe there would be some gain i i would say that's a tricky one chronic renal failure okay mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's kind of tricky. I don't know if I. That's a good. If their kidneys aren't functioning, then they're gonna be. That's weird. Yeah, and see, acute renal failure, they'll take steroids, right? That's uh, maybe they got this wrong. Maybe they meant to put acute or something. We'll see. Don't worry, y'all will know that. A nurse is caring for a child who has acute post streptococcal glomerul nephritis. Which of the following manifestations should the nurse expect? Select all that apply. Periorbital edema, for sure. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look horrible. They look sick. Mm -hmm. see. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Would hypertension be a part of that, you think, or no? Yeah, they're probably, yeah. Let's look and see. Yep. Don't forget, it says periorbital edema, ill appearance, and hypertension. Remember, whenever the kidneys have a problem, they're probably going to have some type of hypertension uh, in the kidney because the kidney does control blood pressure. They don't really give you a lot of like extra stuff over here on the side to look at it. Uh, because you have to know everything, I would kind of compare them. I would take all of these and compare them and then write the labs up and down and you'll see that what is similar and you'll see which one is different. Then highlight which one is different because I bet you with this, let me look at this here. You've got one, two, three, four, five, 
you got five different subjects with five different questions on this test, right? So uh, let's see, we got five questions on renal and look, one is farm, three are reduction of risk potential and one is physiological adaption. Hmm. So be aware, look at this one on GI, we're gonna go to that one next and then we'll be done for today. But look, reduction of risk potential, physiological adaption. And then one over here, management of care. So we're going to go. Did we say that was chapter 23? Mm -hmm. I just um, yeah. wanted to mention something. So we only have five questions on renal, but that covers 24 and 26, right? Because let me look 24 and, and possibly 25. I don't know, because 24 was enuresis and UTIs. And then 26 is renal disorders. You know and, what? You know what? Yeah, they didn't really make it specific, like how sometimes yeah. they usually do the chapters, so, so they're just kind of grouping it together. So let me see if that really falls or anything else. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, they should be more specific. Yeah. Like I think you're right, Jacob. I think that is what you're seeing. And so, I think it's gonna be that way too for the other ones because it's not specific. It's just like renal, yeah. hematologic, endocrine, renal. whatever. Okay. So know it all. They got to <laughs> know it all. Basically. Yeah, just know everything and you'll be Yeah, fine. it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's not fair. Let's go to uh let's go to wherever I was at. Let's look at this one. And um we are going to go Hold on. Let me close this down. I don't want this up. Yes. I don't know why it asked me that. Okay. Um we're going to go to the GI because 15 questions are from GI and uh let's just get it over with so you'll have time to like go through it the renal i'm so happy we did today because that's going to take you a minute to walk your mind oh, around with the gi is it chapter 22 and 23 oh yes i would believe so wouldn't you would you guys agree mm -hmm. yeah let's okay so let's start with 22 then very good thank you you know y'all go keep me straight all right here we go Y'all have to realize I'm just making this up as I'm going. So we're, we are too. it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. So, um, okay. Think about 15 of the questions and as we're going to think, okay, that's a question. I, I'll try to, you know, pick it out. Uh, we have acute infections, gastrointestinal disorders, um, diarrhea can be mild, severe, acute, chronic. It can result to mild to severe dehydration. Anytime you have di diarrhea, we think of, you know, dehydration. Acute diarrhea, so there's a difference here, is a sudden increase in the frequency and change of the consistency of the stool, usually secondary to some infection or GI tract, upper respiratory tract thing, or antibiotic use or something like that. Self-resolution usually occurs within 14 days. If dehydration does not occur, then it says acute infectious diarrhea is caused by a variety of viral, bacterial, or path, uh, uh, parasitic uh, pathogens. So we got this acute diarrhea that will usually resolve in like 14 days. Could be from a lot of things. Chronic diarrhea is an increase in frequency and change of consistency of stools for more than 14 days. Do you see how the time frame is there? So less than 14 days, more than 14 days. And if it's more than 14 days, it could be malabsorption, food allergy, inflammatory bowel. So chronic nonspecific diarrhea has no identify, you know, we don't know, it doesn't have a cause. And then we know what dehydration is, right? So when we look here, lack of normal elimination pattern, lack of clean water, poor hygiene, crowded living environments, those are all risk factors for us to get diarrhea, poor sanitation, and maybe even some nutrial, nutritional deficits. The patient with diarrhea, obviously, if they're getting rid of tons of fluid, are going to have fatigue, malaise, maybe some change in behavior, change in stool, poor appetite, weight loss, pain, and it, obviously that's the main thing you're going to watch for is dehydration and maybe some electrolytes. Ooh, now, here's the thing. If it's a virus, they're saying, hey, pay attention to rotavirus because in children, and I have to remember we're talking children, in children, rotavirus is a diarrheal disease. Most common cause of diarrhea in young children, younger than five, affects children of all ages, 
fever, watery stools, diarrhea to five to seven days, vomiting for about two days. It is fecal oral. Hmm. So somebody had to touch it and then put it in their mouth, right? Incubation period, 48 hours. Little children tend to put their hands in their pants. In fact, we were walking in the mall the other day, and there was a little three-year-old walking with his hands down in his underwear. I thought, okay, well, there you go. That could be something. In the future, you never know, because that's just how they do, right? So rotavirus, know what that is. And there's something called Yersinia intercolitis, which is a bacterial infection. So we've got a viral infection for rotavirus. And I think they might ask you, is this a virus? Is this a bacteria? This a virus has to just work its way out of the body, right? A bacteria, you can probably take antibiotics for. So they are maybe have bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever. Pets and food are the way this transmits. And it's a one to three week in incubation period. Okay, and then we've got E. coli, which causes a lot of issues for everybody, which is normally found in the in the stool. And just remember, uh, watery diarrhea for one to two days, followed by abdominal cramping, bloody diarrhea could lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome. That's pretty interesting. Hmm. Transmission depends on the strain of E. coli. So about three to four days incubation period and then salmonella which is bacterial infection, severe, mild to severe vomiting, abdominal cramping, bloody diarrhea, fever. I don't know. See, they are all are vomiting, abdominal cramping, bloody diarrhea. How do we tell them apart? We just got to know if they're bacteria or virus, I think. So headache, confusion, drowsiness can lead to meningitis or septicemia, person to person, undercooked meats and poultry. Incubation is six to 72 hours. So what I would do, if I was going to write them down, I'd say rotavirus, which, you know, it says virus in it. It's a viral, right? Uh, any type of intercolitis or E. coli is bacterial. And then salmonella is also bacterial. Okay. Let's go down here. Clostridium difficile. You guys know you're going to get a question on that, right? Um, what is C. diff? Bacteria. Oh. Mm. Is it contagious? Yep, it is. How do you get it? Um, you can come in contact with it. Right. It's contact precaution. Ooh, it's contact precaution. So uh, this is what it looks like. It says uh, mild watery diarrhea for a few days, possible less severe manifestations in children than in adults. So adults might be worse. Look at the labs here. Possible leukocytosis, hypoalbuminemia, and a high fever in certain children. Possible pseudomembranous colitis. Now, here's my take on this. If they say pseudomembranous colitis, that's the same thing as C. diff. Okay, that's how I look at it because it's the same thing. <laughs> and so if either way, you may be looking for C. diff and it's not there and it says pseudomembranous colitis. So it, it is contact, right? And we don't know how long it takes to incubate there. But then look at here. There's another type of clostridium, botulinum. This is also bacteria. It says cramping, diarrhea, possible respiratory CNS problems, contaminated food, 12 to 26 hours. Does it? Um, I got to look here. Oh, wait. Where is it? Hold on. Is this, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Let me see if it's under here. I want to see what it says real quick. Uh, disorders. Uh, it says, know the difference between acute and chronic diarrhea. Differentiate findings from acute infectious gastrointestinal disorders. Enterobius vermiculus. Says, okay. I don't know if we have to know all those. Do, what do you guys think? Oh, wait, I'm in the other one. What do you think on this? Uh, hang on. Let me look and make sure down here. I, yeah. I don't think so because, okay, on module 2C, it's way more specific on what we need to know. Okay. It didn't say specifically about all the C. diffs. It just says um, just the disorders, but then it tells you specifically 
to look at the intro the whatever vermicular vermicular yeah where is that though that's what it's i'm trying right, to it was right on the same page as c diff right it's there henworm. Uh, henworm. <laughs> let's let's just go there it but if here let me just say something here if you have shigella i'm just gonna say something that doesn't say it there hmm. i was gonna say it feels like knife stabbing in your rectum but it doesn't say that here. So Shigella is a bacteria, but it feels different. Has any, okay, this is, I can see why they would ask pinworm. What is a pinworm? Tell me what that is. I know that when people have pinworms, like it tells you like they're, they'll complain of like their butt itching a lot. And some people might say, oh, it might be hemorrhoids, but it could possibly be like a pinworm. That's right. Kids, kids can get pinworms. Uh, they're called helamiths. And a uh, helamith is a worm. Do you see helamithic infection? It's a worm. And they're little white, almost very clear worms. And, and I'm just going to tell you, this is going to gross you out. But in the middle of the night, if you want to know if your child has them, you just open their little butt cheeks with a flashlight and look, and the little pinworms will come out around the anus. So if you see here, it says perianal itching. In uresis, they might be wetting the bed sleeplessness restlessness irritability due to itching so if you see sleeplessness the reason why they can't sleep is because these little worms are coming out and causing all this little havoc on their little rectal area their anal area uh it is fecal oral which is kind of a i remember when my kids were little this one mother she said my son has something i just don't want to tell you what it is and i said well just tell me what how am i supposed to know what's going on she goes he has pinworms i'm like okay and she goes but it's so gross because it's fecal oral and i just didn't want to say and i'm like but kids get that that's what is common in in some kids so they either ingest or they inhale the eggs um and it says ingested or inhaled eggs hatch in the upper intestine and mature <laughs> now this is gross after mating worms migrate out of the intestines and lay eggs eggs can survive for two to three weeks on the surface uh, what they'll also tell you to do, and this is just off the record here, is at night you put a piece of scotch tape on your little baby's anus, and then in the morning you peel it off, and the worms will get stuck to the anus, and you can also see them that way. Um, get stuck to the tape. So uh, I know pinworm is is really kind of gross, but what do you think they're going to ask about it? How, you how long those eggs can survive? Yeah. What is it? Like, where are they itching? It's eggs that are ingested or inhaled, and they'll usually mature in the upper intestine, and then they'll migrate and lay eggs, and they'll survive on the surface for two to three weeks. Ugh. Okay, I think I would remember that. Is that, did it say anything about tapeworm or anything? No, but it did say we just have to know the diagnostic procedure for um, pinworm. Okay. So the that's probably what I just told you, but I don't know. We're gonna read it. So or that's the tape test. Yeah, there you go. Right. Oh, wow. you just told yeah. us about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it's all up here. I don't know why, but it's there. somewhere. Sometimes I can't pull it out. But if you look, parents should place transparent tape over the child's anus at bed. See, y'all thought I was making that up. Preferably after the child is asleep, the caregiver should remove the tape just prior to the child awakening, if possible, prior to the child toileting or bathing. The specimen should be brought to the lab for a microscopic evaluation for the presence of pinworms or ova. Parents should use good hand hygiene during this procedure because guess what? You could also get it. So you don't want to be touching it with your hands because it's fecal oral. So if you didn't wash your hands, right? Hmm. Okay. I think that is going to be important. I didn't see infectious gastroenteritis. I have to really look. Oral. Oh, just says um, understanding nursing care and client education for oral rehydration therapy. Okay, let's look. Let's go to it then. Um, it's right here on page 137, right there. It's right there. Okay. So let's look. What are we going to do? Because I'm, I can see why they're going to ask this too. If you have diarrhea, diarrhea, excuse me. And you are losing tons of fluid. You as a nurse got to know how to educate them to replace this oral solution. So I think this is a test question. I think pinworms is a test question. Um, start replacement with an oral replacement solution, uh, 75 to 90 milli equivalents of sodium at 40 to 50 mils per kilogram over four hours. 
I don't know if you have to memorize that or not, but just know you would give them uh, oral, I mean, it says oral replacement. Um, determine the need for further rehydration after the initial replacement. Initiate maintenance therapy, uh, oral replacement of 40 to 60 mil equivalents and limit it to 150 mils per kilogram per day. There's a lot of numbers in here, so I would look at those a little bit more. Give oral replacement alternately with intake of other liquids, breast milk, formula, and milk. Give infants water, breast milk, or lactose-free formula if supplementary fluid is needed. Older children may resume their regular diets for additional intake. Replace each diarrheal stool with 10 mils per kilogram of oral rehydration for ongoing diarrhea. So just know we're going to do a maintenance fluid. We're going to replace fluids in this patient. Go back and look at the numbers just in case you see them. I don't know, but, you know, they get kind of tricky on that. Um, I am going to say something to you. Uh, there is this drug. Do you see Mebendazole? <laughs> okay, y'all ready to hear this? Me been there, done that, don't want to worm again. And that's how I tell the students to remember the treatment is Mebendazole. Okay, for a worm, for a helamith, you need Bebendazole. Okay, uh, me been there, done that, don't want to worm again. If that helps you remember it. And that would be for this interobious vermiculosis, whatever you want to say, pinworms. Administer a single dose that can need to be repeated in two to four weeks after mebendazole for children older than two years of age. Oh, it says administer it. Entire family should be treated at the same time. So everybody's going to get mebendazole, right? Um, if, the, if the little child has a worm. Parents should inform the child's school or daycare of the infestation. That sounds really bad. The child should stay home during incubation period. Teach the family to use commercially prepared uh, oral rehydration solutions. So let's see. I think this is going to be a, a, okay. Didn't it say GI one question on, uh, is there one question on farm? Or how, uh, is, no, for GI, no. there's no questions on okay. farm. Well, you might see that again on your boards. There's been management of care, and there's five on reduction in risk, and then there's nine on phys physiological adaption. Okay. All right. So I think you're going to have to know what, sp what fluids can you give to the child, right? Uh, fruit juices, carbonated sodas, it, these are foods and fluids to avoid. No fruit juice, no sodas. With carbonation, gelatin, uh, which have all high carb content, low electrolyte content, and a high osmolarity. Caffeine due to its mild diuretic effect. Chicken or beef broth, which has too much sodium and not enough carbs. Now, see here, I would have thought, hey, you could give beef broth. They give it in the hospital. But what they're saying here is it says if they're having diarrhea, foods and fluids to avoid would affect like a sodium, you know, balance or electrolyte imbalances. So just, you can give Pedialyte. Have y'all heard of that? Like Pedialyte with all the electrolytes in it. And now they're, you know, we used to tell adults, even if you're having diarrhea, go get some children's Pedialyte and drink it. And now they're making Pedialyte for adults. I saw that the other day. Um, perform preventative measures, including immunization for rotavirus. You can get an, you can get an immunization for that. And uh, have your baby uh, get that so they don't get the rotavirus. Change bed linens and underwear daily for several days. Avoid shaking linens to prevent the spread of disease. I think they're talking about pinworms. Keep child's toys away from other children. Cleanse the toys. Shower frequently. Avoid undercooked or under-refrigerated meats. Perform proper high-end hygiene after toileting and changing diapers. There may be a question on that. Do not share dishes and utensils. Wash them in hot, soapy water. Best thing to do, put them in the dishwasher. Clip nails and discourage nail biting and thumb sucking, especially after they put the little hands down in their underwear because they could have pinworms, right? So there is something on dehydration. Is that correct? Let's look. I thought I saw it. Dehydration. Yeah, right there. So here we go. Okay, so... Um, how are y'all feeling about the types of solutions to correct fluid uh, deficits? How do y'all feel? Because we we talked about this previously in another class. I don't know if y'all saw the video where we talked about 
isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Y'all yeah. remember? That? Yeah. Okay. Remember that. So we may just need to fill the vessel. Like the the vein, the vessel may be a little low uh, in fluid. And if we don't want to shift fluid anywhere, we can give an isotonic solution, right? Um, it, blood sodium is within normal limits when you give an isotonic solution, it's most like your blood. And, it, and the reason why they say it's most like your blood is probably has the most sodium like your blood in there. A hypotonic solution actually has less salt in it and a hypertonic solution has more salt in it. And we can shift fluids with those solutions. Um, remember, and if, I, I mean, I guess I could draw it out here for you, but remember with a hypotonic solution, when we give less salt into the vessel, where does it push the fluid? Into the cell. That's right. Because hypo has an O in it right there. And I say it sends it to the O. It sends it to the cell. Hypertonic does the opposite. It pulls it. What? Go ahead. Moves it into the vessel. That's right. Very good. So just be aware and, and see how when we talked about that earlier, you need to know. If you give a hypotonic solution, what would you really need to watch for as far as brain goes? Intracranial pressure. Yes, that is correct. If you give a hypertonic solution, what would you watch for? Watch for everything. That's why they give it in the ICU. Yes, but what they're what you're going to do is you're going to pull so much fluid out of the cell. Remember, sixty percent of our fluid is in our cell. That we're going to have some. We could have shock because we're going to pull fluid from the cells and, and pee it out. So we could also have some neural changes there too, right? Um, levels of dehydration, they may ask you the levels. Uh, if a child has weight loss, 3% to 5% in infants and 3 to 4% in children, uh, that's mild. And I would know what is mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, moderate weight loss is 6 to 9 in infants, 6 to 8 in children. And if you look down here with the infants, probably looking at the fontanelles, blood pressure, capillary refill, and the infant and child might be slightly thirsty. Down here, what you could do for moderate uh, dehydration is they have dry mucous membranes. So you could pull up, open their mouth and look at their little gums. And if they're really white and dry, then they're probably moderately dehydrated. Um, they might have a sunken fontanel. But if you look back up here, severe, I want you to see definite sunken fontanel, no urine output, extreme thirst, very dry mucous membranes, the skin tense. Um, pay attention there. It says greater than 10% in infants and children would be very, very severe. So go back into that. And if you guys need me to go over this isotonic, hypotonic, whatever, again, I'll be happy to do that. Or you can go on my YouTube thing and watch. I have a, a video there that will help you uh, do it or go over it again. Nursing actions, oral rehydration is attempted first for mild to moderate cases of dehydration. So first of all, let's give them some oral, right? Uh, and it says 50 milligrams per kilogram rehydration fluid within four hours, moderate 100 mils rehydration within four hours and replacement of diarrhea real losses within with 10 mils per kilogram each stool. So we're going to give 10 mils per kilogram after every stool we want them to have. Uh, administer per parenteral uh, fluid therapy as prescribed, initiate and able to train. So what they're saying is first we're going to do oral and then if that doesn't work, then we're going to go IV. Parenteral is IV. Initiate when a child is unable to drink enough oral fluids to correct fluid losses and those with severe dehydration. Isotonic solution at 20 mils per kilogram IV bolus with possible repeat for isotonic and hypotonic dehydration. Hypertonic dehydration rapid fluid replacement is contraindicated because of the risk of cerebral edema. Mm, okay, let me see here. 
lipoid potassium supplements. We can go over this later, that the hypo and acetonic, hypotonic, and, and hypertonic solutions, which might help you do better. So let's go, let's just see what they're going to ask first. Let's just see what kind of thing they're pointing us towards on this. A nurse is caring for a child who has watery diarrhea for the past three days. Which of the following is an action for the nurse to take? B. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think we're going to do uh, oral rehydration therapy, right? Wasn't that the first choice? And it's only been three days. If that doesn't work, then we'll do IV, but we wouldn't do a hypertonic solution. We would do either isotonic or hypotonic. Um, remember, don't give chicken broth. Let's go down to one here. Oral rehydration is recommended. Chicken broth is avoided for children who have diarrhea. Isotonic solutions are recommended for children who experience dehydration. Don't give them, if they're dehydrated, never give them a hypertonic solution. I can see that they would ask that because you've got to know that if you give them a hypertonic solution, you're going to dehydrate them twice as fast, okay? And then uh, remember, children who experience diarrhea are at risk for dehydration. Keep them MPO is contraindicated. So we don't want to keep them MPO. We want them to have fluids. Okay, let's go here. A nurse is caring for a child who's suspected to have interovious vermiculosis, whatever that is. What is that? Remember? What's the actual name? Pinworms. It was a pinworm. Uh-huh. And uh, it's a Gila myth. What medication would you give them? I'm just asking for the boards. The mean, been there, done that. Don't want one again. <laughs> That's true. Me, Bendisol, right? <laughs> when y'all get out in the room. <laughs> I hope y'all remember that. Okay, so which of the following actions should the nurse take? Oh, do the um, tape thing on their butts at night. Yeah, yeah. What's that going to do? Um, in the morning, you will have all the pinworms and you can take it to the lab. There you go. Because they're very, very tiny, crystal clear, kind of a white uh, looking to them. Uh, a nurse is assessing a child who has rotavirus infection. See how that will play a, a role in your ATI questions. Which of the following are expected findings? They're going to have a fever. They'll probably throw up and they'll have watery poop. There you go. There you go. I think so. What do you, anybody else thinking anything? Let's go down. Fever, vomiting. Ooh. Foul smell watery stools is a manifestation of rotor virus. Mm. Vomiting for two days and then foul smelling stools for rotor virus. Mm. These are hard. That's why we're going to say, hopefully they won't ask you all these. <laughs> a nurse is teaching a group of parents about salmonella. Which of the following information should the nurse include in the teaching? Select all that apply. It's a bacteria for sure. For sure. Oh. You can get it from the house pets. Okay. Um, can you treat it with antibiotics? If it's a bacteria, you can, can't you? I think so. You can treat a bacteria with antibiotics. So maybe E. Hmm. Let's go. Let's find out. I'm not wasting any time. Okay. Let's look. Ooh, no. Salmonella is bacterial. Antibiotics are not prescribed unless complications occur. That's tricky. Okay, so correct. Salmonella is classified as a bacterial infection. Yes. See, sometimes I don't agree with what they're saying here because, yes, you can treat them with a bacteria for, yes, you can, but it didn't get specific enough for, for me. I would have picked that. Salmonella include bloody diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramping. Salmonella can be transmitted to children from household pets, cats, dogs, hamsters, and turtles. Right. Every every child has some one of those, right? So guess what? Salmonella, here you come. All right, here we go. A nurse is teaching a group of caregivers about E. coli. Which of the following information should the nurse include in the teaching? Select all that apply. Hmm. Well, I know for sure it's a foodborne pathogen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
let's hope they don't ask. What do y'all, hmm, you know what I was thinking? It can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome. I thought I read that. Really bad cramping. Your stomach will hurt anytime. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay, let's let's go down. Mm -hmm. Severe abdominal cramping. Yes. Look, it can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome and it is a foodborne pathogen. Antibiotics can worsen E. coli infection. They're not recommended. I'm just going to say this. I disagree with that, but okay. We'll just keep it where the ATI wants it, but I disagree with that. Um, I think antibiotics could be used to treat salmonella. So I hope they don't ask you that, but there you go. We'll just, we'll stick with whatever the book says that some of it sometimes contraindicates or contra into, uh, what do I want to say? Contradicts itself. Okay. Gastrointestinal. Ugh, okay. Here we go. Y'all ready? So gastrointestinal structure disorders include cleft lip and palate, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Wow. This is such a lot of stuff. Hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Hirschsprung's disease and interception. Y'all going to have, a, I know y'all going to have a lot of stuff on this one. Uh, first of all, let me look at this real quick. Yep. Look right there. And they have even Me Merkel's or Meckles. I think it's supposed to be Merkel's diverticulum. Uh, GERD, Nissan fundiplication. Some of you, we've already been over some of these, but let's go for it. Are you ready? And we'll be done. All right, cleft lip and cleft palate. I think you guys know what that is. You could either have a cleft lip or a cleft palate. So cleft, uh, I don't even know how to spell cleft anymore. So, oh. -E -F -F. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so here's the thing. There is something called a cleft lip where the baby can have like one side they can have a bilateral where there's two slits going up and the little perineum hanging down. Or they can have a cleft palate where there's an opening inside the palate with a cleft lip. So, so you can see that there's a difference between cleft lip, cleft palate. You could have both or you can have one. And uh, usually when a baby's born, like an OB, the first thing a nurse will do with a gloved hand is like feel the palate of the baby's mouth to see if they have a cleft palate, right? And so um, let's see, family history of cleft palate, could be some maternal factors that cause it, alcohol, cigarette smoking, anticonvulsants, retinoids, steroids during pregnancy could all cause it. And here's some pictures right here. You, a cleft lip is a visible separation of the upper lip toward the nose and a cleft palate is the opening on the palate. I think that's pretty easy for you guys to know, but what I think they're going to do is say, Okay, if you had a uh, mother who just gave birth to a baby with a cleft lip or cleft palate, what would be the first question you would ask? I'd say, uh, when can this get repaired? Would you would you say that? Probably. <laughs> yeah, because they're going to ask you that question and a cleft lip repair is typically done between two to three months of age. Revisions are usually required in severe def defects. So when are they going to repair the lip? Two to three months. Repair is typically done between six to 12 months for a palate. Hmm. That's what, that's kind of an important thing. Now, if you see preoperative, what are we going to do? Inspect the lip, the palate, use a glove finger to palpate the palate. Assess their ability to suck because if they do have a cleft palate, they can't suck very good and they have to use what's called a, a lamb's nipple. It's like the longer, it's really weird. Obtain baseline weight, observe interaction between family and infant. Here's the thing. Make sure the infant is bonding with mom and dad because sometimes when something's wrong, then there's not a bonding there. So that's why they say observe interaction. Determine family coping and support. Refer parents to appropriate support groups. Contact social services for help with finance and insurance. Um, instruct patient parents about proper feeding and care, right? First of all, you're going to tell them when can it be repaired. And then if you look, it says for isolated cleft lip. I didn't know there was an isolated one. 
but I guess if it's just one side, encourage breastfeeding. Use a wide base nipple for bottle feeding. Squeeze the infant's cheeks together during feeding to decrease the gap. So if it's just like one, I'm going to say maybe like this side, just the cleft lip all by itself, then we could bottle feed. But if it says for cleft palate or cleft lip and palate, this is going to be a test question, okay? Position the infant upright while cradling the head during feeding. Use a special bo specialized bottle with a one-way valve and a specialty cut nipple. Burp the infant frequently because they're going to inhale a lot of air. Syringe feeding can be necessary for infants who is unsuccessful with, with other methods. So make sure you would know what to do or how to teach the mom to feed the baby. So let's look here. Keep the infant pain-free. Let me look and see if there's anything. I know there's one thing I'm looking for. Avoid spoons, forks, and other objects the infant might bring to their mouth and could damage their incision. Way daily. I'm looking for there's a hang on. Uh there's something that they usually ask. Okay, I think I know what it is. It's down here on the palette. So uh let's see, position the infant. Okay. After is I think this is gonna be after surgery, post op, yes. Um, position the infant on the back, which is good, and upright on the side during the immediate post operative period to maintain the integrity of the repair. An elbow restraint to keep the infant from reaching up and pulling on the side. Restraint should be removed periodically to assist skin and allow limb movement and provide comfort. Use water or diluted hydrogen peroxide to clean the incision site. I've seen that before. Apply antibiotic ointment if prescribed. Gently aspirate secretions of the mouth and the nasopharynx to prevent respiratory complications. So can you put restraints on an infant with a cleft lip repair? Yes. yes, yes. And how do you position them, right? And make sure you know how would you clean it. Now here's your palette and there is, I'm looking for something, but they don't have it here. They usually have like this little bar that comes out after surgery and they have to be laying on this, the other, oh look, here we see, maybe it's here. Change the infant's position frequently to facilitate drainage and breathing. Place the infant in sideline position in the immediate post-operative period. Maintain IV fluids until the infant is able to eat or drink. The infant is usually MPO for four hours, uh, then allowed liquids for the first three to four days, then progress to a soft diet. Avoid placing a straw, tongue depressor, hard pacifier, rigid utensils, hard tip sippy cups, or suction catheters in the infant's mouth. Elbow restraints can be used. Uh, close observation for manifestations of airway, hemorrhage, laryngeal spasm, and face mask. I don't see anything. I'm just going to say sideline. Maybe keep them MPO for the first four hours. Don't put anything hard in their mouth. Um, okay. I don't see what I'm looking for, but I want you to see who might have to care for the baby. Care of the child who has a cleft lip or cleft palate requires care from a lot of team members. Plastic surgeon, orthodontist, orontologist, I can't even say that, oral, laryngologist, speech language, pathologist, pediatrician, nursing, audiologist, social worker, and psychologist. That's a lot of people. That's a big team for, for this. So um, they could get ear infections, have some hearing loss. Uh, feed the infant in an upright uh, position. They have this altered structure with the cliff palate. They will have altered structure in their eustachian tube might not be right where it's supposed to be. So we got to watch for ear infections, okay? And um, observe for manifestation of ear infection and seek treatment. Speech, because of that cleft palate, uh, their tongue, ha you know, when you talk, your tongue touches the roof of your mouth. And without that roof of their mouth there, they may have trouble with their speech or even with the repair. Dental problems, the teeth might be offset. They might need an orthodontist, okay? Um, with this one, I'm just going to say know what, what they are, know how to feed them, know uh, blah, 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 the coping coping with this is going to be big and know 
uh, when can it be repaired? Remember, remember I said the first thing a mom's going to ask you is when can this be repaired? When can we do something about this? Because it really is bothersome to the parent. GERD, I know 100% you know that. We shouldn't spend a whole lot of time on it. It's interesting that a baby or a child would have GERD, but it says GERD is self-limiting and usually resolves by one year of age. So it doesn't really, you know, it's not going to continue on the rest of their life. Maybe their little sphincter is just immature. Uh, but what would it look like? Maybe spitting up or forcefully vomiting, irritability, excessive crying, blood and vomitus, arching the back, stiffening, respiratory problems, failure to thrive in apnea. So it can cause a lot of issues, but uh, it says, you know, risk factors could be, look, hiatal hernia, could be prematurity, could be a bronchopulmonary dysplasia, neurological impairments, asthma, cystic fibrosis. I don't think they're going to go into too much detail on GERD, uh, or I may be wrong. Uh, they doctor might do an upper an EGD on them to look, and then 24-hour interesophageal pH study may may happen. Don't know that they're going to ask that. What I do think they're going to ask is the nursing care for it. Okay, so it depends on the severity, right? Small, frequent meals, thickened infant formula with one teaspoon or one tablespoon of rice cereal per one ounce of formula. Hmm. I think that might be a test question. Avoid foods that can cause reflux. That I don't think you're going to give your baby a Coca-Cola. But just in case, don't give them caffeine, citrus, peppermint, spicy, or fried foods. Peppermint tends to cause more gastric acid. And obviously, weight control. See how some of this, I don't think, plays a role in, in an infant. Position the child with the head elevated after meals. Place infant supine to sleep rather than prone. Uh, Sideline or or sitting upright. So we're going to put them Safan to sleep with GERD. Um, initiate interventions for GERD plus administering a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, omeprazole. So don't don't think just because they're a baby they can't have a proton pump inhibitor, or they can get uh, an H2 blocker, which is your your dines, your cimetidine, your famotidine, dinedine. Uh, so just remember that. They may, if you guys remember from the adult version we talked about a couple, I don't know when, but it was just this semester. Um, <clears throat> the um, the sphincter between the stomach and the esophagus may be loose or maybe a hiatal hernia, and they may have to have this surgery called a Nissan fundoplication. Remember, it's not a fun vacation. I don't know if you remember this Nissan fundoplication, but they may ask it. So this is why I am going to show you a picture of it if there's GERD oh and we have to do a Nissan fundoplication this is what it looks like and so uh, what they'll do is they will take the top part of the stomach uh, right here and they will take it and wrap it around the esophagus to make it tight and you can see how they wrapped it around here and remember, it's not going to be fun. I can't imagine doing this on a baby, uh, but I guess if you had to, I, I can't imagine that they're going to do this on a baby. I, I just, I don't know why they would. But um, what it is, is you got, after that, you can't burp, you can't vomit. Um, yeah, I don't know, but just know what it is. That is a board question, but it's usually for adults. Uh, recurrent pneumonia, weight loss, failure to thrive can all be from GERD and um, you would just watch for the signs and symptoms of pneumonia and then let's look here what is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis now guys you're going to get this test question okay GERD you might get I think you're going to have no trouble answering GERD uh, unless you just get that Nissan fund application which I can't imagine they would do for a child but apparently it's in the atiabic so maybe they just put it in there uh, let's see. Okay, so this is very important uh, for you to see a picture of. I don't know, maybe y'all, maybe this is boring and y'all don't want a picture, but here you go. Um, what you got is you got the fundus of the stomach up here. You got this is actually there's a sphincter up here in the top part that should stay closed, and that's called, believe it or not, the cardiac sphincter. 
Some people will call it the esophageal sphincter, but it's actually called the car uh, cardiac sphincter. Then down toward the duodenal area, what will happen is this tissue is very thick. And if you notice, you can't pass anything through this little tiny opening. This is called the pyloric sphincter and they call it pyloric stenosis. Now, let me ask you something on this, which I think they're going to ask you. If a baby was born with pyloric stenosis, what would their vomit look like? Probably bowel because they can't push it out. Can they get bowel back up through here? Yeah. Nope. Nothing's, no. nothing's yes. coming out. Nothing's coming back. What would their vomit look like? Mm. This is the big one. Okay. It's projectile vomiting. So uh, look. It becomes projectile as obstruction worsens. They like to ask that question. With pyloric stenosis, how do you know a baby has it? Projectile vomiting. Okay, don't forget that. Projectile vomiting. Um, and it has no bile in the vomit. It could be a little blood tinge. They're going to be constantly hungry because none of the food is making it down into the intestine. Nothing's coming back up in from the intestine, nothing's going down. It's all like swollen off. This is another question they like to ask. You will have an olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen and peristaltic wave that moves from left to right when laying supine. Y'all better highlight that. An olive shaped mass in the right upper quadrant. So if we look, this would be our left side and this is our right side. And as it comes out of the stomach, it will feel as the doctor checks on it, it's going to feel like a olive, feels like a little olive shape in there. Olive shape mass in the right upper quadrant. Y'all got that? Because that's a test question. Uh, projectile vomiting, olive shape mass, and maybe constant hunger. Those are going to be signs. And you're going to have that peristaltic wave, which means that Okay, let me say this. You guys right now, you don't see the peristalsis in your intestines because you have stool in your intestine. But when someone has nothing in their intestine, like they clean themselves out maybe for a colonoscopy, their bowel is going to start moving really, really uh, wild. And you might even be able to see it on the outside of the skin because it's going, where's the food? And this is what's happening here. They're not getting anything down into the intestine. And so the peristaltic wave is going to go from left to right. It's like, hey, where's the food here? And uh, they're not going to be gaining weight because they're not getting food down in there. We're going to look at electrolytes. We could see an ultrasound reveals an elongated mass surrounding the elongated pyloric canal. I'm just going to say pyloric sphincter. I think these are the two things they're going to ask you about. If you go and do some practice questions, I'll show you that's what they ask. Um, they may have to do what's called a pyelomyotomy. And what do you think that is, guys? What do you think a pyelomyotomy is? What are they going to do here? Hmm. Just open it, probably. Yep. They're probably going to have to cut open that area and open it up so the food and it can move down into the sm uh, small intestine. And it's, that's what it's called, a pyelomyotomy. So uh, you may have to have a nasogastric tube for decompression, MPO, Osinos, daily weight. Just be familiar with what that means, okay? Let's see if there's anything post-op we need to know. Obtain routine post-operative vital signs, provide IV fluids, monitor daily weights, administer analgesics, same thing. Start clear liquids four to six hours after surgery and advance to breast milk or formula as tolerated 24 hours after. Okay, I don't think you're going to have to have the post-op one on this. What I think it's going to be is be able to recognize it. And you'll get a snarl, projectile vomiting, olive-shaped mass, peristaltic waves, those kind of things, okay? Um, it may be just like one or two questions on that, or just one even. Now, who knows what Hirschsprung's disease is? Anybody? Mm -hmm. You mean I can't give a million-dollar candy bar to anybody? You still owe us so much money. We're, I, 
I know I'm in debt. I'm going to have to pay y'all at graduation for something. I'll give y'all candy bar. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here it is right here. And I always say her sprungs is like you sprung a leak, but you're not really leaking. What it is, is that the little baby. So here's a normal intestine, right? And the intestine has these little ganglion cells like nerves that keep the that keep the uh, intestines nice and tight and help um, you know stool move through uh, down into the rectum. Now look, it has no ganglion cells affected by Hirschsprungs. What that means is is it balloons out and so it's not going to be able to push the stool and any stool they get is going to kind of get stuck here because look at the rectum. It's super tiny and narrow. And this person, so I'll tell you what they like to ask about this one, ribbon-like stools. That's what they like to ask. So they'll probably say, what kind of stools do they have? Let's see. I'm just going to jump down to uh, therapeutic. Let's see, common complications. Ah, it doesn't say. Um, it doesn't say ribbon-like stools right here. Where it, I can it see. says. Do you I see it? Uh-huh. Okay. Mm. And now foul, it says foul smelling ribbon like stool. Yes, that's what they're gonna ask you. Okay. When you see a ribbon like stool, that means the rectum is very <clears throat> very narrow and you possibly have Hirschsprung's disease. Um, let's look at it <coughs> from this perspective here. Hirschsprung's is congenital egg colonic megacolon. <clears throat> Did you see the colon is like really large? Um, and it is a structural ab anomaly of the GI tract caused by a lack of ganglion cells in the segments of the colon, which causes it not to be able to move very good and it causes an obstruction. So um, in a newborn, let's look, they won't pass. And they'd like to ask this too. In a newborn, you, the newborn should pass Marconium stool within 24 to 48 hours. If they don't, we're thinking Hirschsprung's. Episodes of vomiting bowel, refusal to eat, abdominal distension. I'm not too worried about those. I'm thinking marconium stool is the trigger. For an infant, maybe constipation, vomiting, episodes of diarrhea. But you know what? The one they're going to ask is the child. Ribbon-like stools. They Are they going to look a little undernourished? Yes. Maybe a little anemic. Maybe some visible peristalsis. But the ribbon-like stool is going to be your giveaway for this for this disease okay um they may have to do a rectal biopsy to you know look at the absence of ganglion cells there in that um colon uh we're gonna have to give we're gonna have to send them to surgery they're gonna have to remove part of that um that colon and it says provide uh nutritional status high protein high calorie low fiber and maybe even tpn you know, because gosh, how are they going to go to the bathroom? And then they're going to remove that a ganglionic section of the bowel may have a temporary colostomy, um, electrolyte fluid replacement, bowel prep with saline enemas or oral antibiotic. Oh, and oral antibiotics. I don't think they're going to ask that. Uh, assist bowel sounds, provide ostomy care. Guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a if I was a million dollar better, I would bet on this right here. Ribbon like stool. That's where you're gonna see it. Okay. Do we have intercolitis? Mm. I see GERD, pyosinosis, high sprung disease. I see um something about interception, appendicitis. Mm. It kills diverticulum. Yeah. Let's see what this is. Uh... That's it. Okay. Uh, let's go to... Yeah, have that okay. Let's go to interception. Definitely, I know what you're going to get on this question. Who? Somebody tell me, what is interception? No, I know. I know, I know. I didn't know either before I did all this, but... Interception is interesting. Adults can even get it. Um, this little girl the other day, she said, what do you think I have? Because she was having some fat, fatty stools. And um, this is interception. So what it is, is there's a weak area between the lar 
ooh, between the large and the small intestine and the small intestine will invert itself. It'll flip up inside of the large intestine and it's called um, interception. Okay. Now here's the thing. I'm going to tell you the thing about it. A lot of times they'll have fat, fatty stools, fat, maybe some blood in their stool. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's just making more mucus there. But uh, we worry about this part of the intestine because it's inverted up inside that it's going to have the blood supply cut off to it. So with interception, we worry about the, the actual colon having the blood supply cut off. Now, if we were to go through the rectum and put a barium enema in here, sometimes the weight of the enema will push it back out to where it needs to go. And sometimes they'll do an air enema to do the same thing. But let's look and see what they want you to know here. So it says the proximal segment of the bowel telescopes into a more distal segment resulting in lymphatic and venous obstruction causing edema in the area with progression ischemia and increased mucus in the intestine will occur. Common in infants and children aged three months to six years. Very common in a small child, but it can be common. I've seen it in an adult around the age of 50. So uh, look at screaming, drawing their knees to their chest. Oh, right here, right here. Do you see? This is your test question. A sausage shape mass because it's inverted up into itself. Sometimes it's in the right lower quadrant. That's what they'll say. A sausage shaped mass in the right lower quadrant. We think interception. The stools are mixed with blood and mucus that resemble the consistency of red currant jelly. The red currant jelly stool. Now, I, you know, you're going to be looking for that on the test, red currant jelly, and they're going to say like a jelly type stool or a um, mucusy stool. They probably word it like that. So don't get confused there. But they have pain, screaming with their knees drawn up to their chest, uh, the sausage shaped mass and the mucousy stool. And so get this little gal that I had to go uh, see the other day, she was telling me she has a really mucousy, fatty stool. And when she went to put it in the test tube, it was so fatty, it wouldn't hardly go in the test tube. She's, what do you think I have? And I said, ah, the only thing I can think of is interception. That's what it sounds like. Um, so I don't know if if that's what she has or not. I'll be interested to see. Um, so we're going to, the big thing is, what are we going to do? And here you go, right there. Air enema. Remember I said you they can blow air in. It'll be performed by a radiologist. The, the nurse is not going to do that. Um, but what will happen sometimes, they can do a barium enema too but probably air is the best choice. And then uh, what happens is that muscle is weak there. So it can reoccur and it can invert itself again. So look, reoccurring interception, we may have to just take that part of the bowel out because we can't just keep having it invert itself up in there. All right. So what do you think about interception? What, what, would, what are some when you guys get on these these diseases, I want you to think trigger things. Like what's going to trigger your mind? What what does this look like? What do you mean? They're going to have like a this to their chest. They're going to be screaming and mucus with red bloody jelly looking. Red and the coffee shape in the right lower quadrant. Yep. Yep. And I'm not going to go into much more detail because I know that's what they're going to shoot for there. Uh, but you know, it's in a small child, right? And so you, if you remember those things, I think you'll do fine. Now you guys know what appendicitis is. We talked about that. I think we even just had that, but usually it occurs in an age of 10 years old. Um, but where in the body would you see that? Like what quadrant of the body? Look right here. The right lower quadrant always. Yeah. You have to know what quadrant you're seeing your appendicitis in. Look, it says rigid abdomen, decrease, rigid abdomen would be like if it, if it perforated, right? Decrease absent bowel sounds, fever, diarrhea, constipation. One thing I know is like when my daughter had her appendicitis, she kept feeling like she was constipated. You never give an enema to someone you suspect is going to, is having, um, what do you call it? Uh, appendicitis. So we look at a CBC and a urinalysis to rule out maybe what's going on here. Uh, 
CT scan will show the appendix. Usually it might show a little fluid. Let me tell you, I have to tell y'all a story. Okay. So there was a girl that um, she came in for lower quadrant pain and uh, the doctors did a CT on her and saw like a little bit of fluid there around the appendix. And so um, they thought, okay, you have appendicitis, even though, you know, her labs weren't terribly horrible. So they took her in for surgery and it wasn't appendicitis, but they took her appendix out anyways. You know what it was? It was an STD. Mm. It had gone up from her, her uterus through the fallopian tubes out into the peritoneal cavity and sat down around her appendix. And it looked like it was her appendix on the thing. So they had to clean her pretty good. And luckily it was one that she could be treated uh, with an antibiotic. So you got to rule out some things when you're looking at appendicitis. But if you look, that right lower quadrant pain should tell you that this person's probably having appendicitis. Um, they're going to do laparoscopic surgery. So um, just, you know, antibiotics, fluid replacement. Always make sure the bowel sounds return and that urination returns. And then let's look post. I think most of it's going to be post-op or pre-op either way. So uh, you're going to replace fluids, maybe an NG tube, maybe, uh, and some antibiotics. But post-op is probably where they're going to go. Respirations we're watching, supplemental oxygen, bowel signs, pain meds, uh, surgical site, bowel sounds, bowel function, IV fluids, MPO, nasogastric tube, wound irrigation, Oh, uh, you know what I think they're going to ask about this? Peritonitis. Let me, let me, and I probably have told you all this before. If a patient comes in with right lower quadrant pain, really in pain, remember they're going to have their knees drawn up, kind of, kind of hunched over to relieve the pain. And then all of a sudden the pain goes away. What does that mean? What could that be? The appendants have exploded. Yeah, it, it perforate, right? So now you got to watch for signs of peritonitis. I do think that's where they're going to go with the question. They may have two questions on appendicitis, but peritonitis is one of the questions that you'll need to be aware of is fever, sudden relief from pain after perforation. If they say that there's sudden relief of pain, don't just say, oh yeah, you can go home. You're fine because it perforated, right? And so we need to, we could go into shock. Um, all right. So peritonitis is the complication of a, uh, you know, appendix or appendicitis, I should say. Uh, let's see, MPO, early ambulation. I, I'm i going to say they're going to probably focus on post-op and, and maybe even some peritonitis with that. Meckel's diverticulum. Let's see what that is, okay? Uh, is a complication resulting from failure of the omphalomesenteric duct to fuse during embryonic development? Uh, we better look, we better look this up so that because I don't even if I was looking at that I would go what I don't know what that means right so we really want to see what that means I think it helps you in in the future when you're on the test you go oh yeah that Mickles I thought it was called I always thought it was called Merkel's okay, let's look here so this is a uh, you guys know what diverticulitis and diverticulosis is Yes. yes. All, all, all it is is a a diverticula in the small bowel. That's what it is. It's a pouching in the small bowel, which is really hard to get to, by the way. Like they like if they have to operate on that, they're they're gonna have to open you up, probably, because this little diverticulum is not easily as you know accessible. And they probably have to find where it is too. So be aware that this is like a little outpouching, uh, just like a diverticula in the small intestine. And we're going to go here. Um, I don't know. It says the omsomestric duct to fuse during embryonic development. Let's just look and see what our, how would you recognize this, right? Look, it says rectal bleeding, usually painless, abdominal pain, bloody mucus stool. Wow. So you know what? A lot of things can have mucus stool. But if you see mucusy stool with a sausage-shaped mass, hmm, then you go with this is not it, right? And so we can look, prepare the child and family for surgery, surgical removal of the diverticulum. Uh, Pre-op and post-op is probably where they're going to go. 
five blood transfusions to correct hypovolemia, menstrual fluids, oxygen, IV antibiotics. Let's see, respiratory status. I'm looking to see if anything stands out to me. Mm, observe for manifestations of infection. Let's look at com GI hemorrhage and bowel obstruction. Um, that's what I would worry about. First of all, I think if you, because of the the place where the little diverticulum is, you know what diverticula, they can get uh, infected, inflamed. They can also cause peritonitis if they rupture. But we also have to know that uh, this is usually painless, but they'll probably just have rectal bleeding. But that's what's kind of tricky here because it says rectal bleeding, usually painless, abdominal pain, which I think it means like they're bleeding from the rectum a little bit, but it doesn't hurt there. It hurts in the abdomen. And then they have some bloody mucus stool. Probably have to do a CBC and a metabolic panel. Um, look, the best way to detect it is a radionucleoside scan because it's in the small intestine. It's like way up in there. Like you can't really even look at the small intestine unless you do swallow a, a camera, like a little pill with a camera in it. Um, you can't get to it from a colonoscopy. You can't get to it from an EGD. So you're kind of kind of left in the position of getting a scan and trying to see if you can find it. And then just knowing that they may have to go in and remove a small part of the small intestine, which can lead to bowel obstruction. Look at this, GI hemorrhage and bowel obstruction. Because, well, when we went to um, see my son uh, and his the little grandbabies, my son uh, years ago had cancer in his appendix and they had to remove part of his uh, colon. And um, every once in a while, he'll get really sick and have a fever and throw up. And he's just really sick. And I was really concerned because I thought, you know, obviously all the things run through your mind. But I thought maybe he was having a bowel obstruction. And his doctor even did, too. She said, when that happens, you're probably having a bowel obstruction. So I was really worried. And he went ahead and had a colonoscopy while we were there. And his colon looked perfectly fine. No scar tissue or anything. So that is really good. But I'm going to tell you, if you have your bowel operated on, most of the time they have uh, scar tissue and a bowel obstruction. But it, look, if you have untreated diverticulum, you could have a bowel obstruction, which would cause the pain, right? And it could perforate. It's just like a diverticulum. So now... Oh, we are almost to the end of this. We are. I'm going to try to pull some questions to show you guys my little things that I told you are going to be correct. So a nurse is assessing an infant who has hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Which of the following manifestations should the nurse expect? Oh, there's one question. Projectile vomiting. Okay. Oh, anybody else? I just remember that. Okay. okay. Constant hunger. Oh, very good. Constant hunger because nothing's making it past there. Is there anything the doctor would D is incorrect. What is it? I just know D is incorrect because I believe it's an almond shaped. Oh, it's an olive shaped mass. Olive. Okay. Olive. Upper right quadrant. That's what I was just fixing to ask you. So do you see how important this is with hypertrophic pyloric stenosis? projectile vomiting, constant hunger, and I'm going to add one, olive shape mass in the right upper quadrant. That's what they'll feel. Okay. All right. Here we go. A nurse is caring for a child who has Hirschsprung's disease. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Take them to surgery. And that's the one that's got the mega colon and the ribbon like stools. Mm, okay. What what anybody else thinking something different? Oh, I think surgery too, but I don't know. Okay. I think we would do high protein, high calorie. I think we would do that. I think we're gonna have to take them to surgery because they don't have those ganglion cells okay. and they're never gonna get better. So we gotta get rid of part of that colon. So we're gonna look. Yes, very good, very good. Um, I want to see, look, low fiber, high protein, high calorie. Low fiber, we don't want to be pushing a lot of fiber down in there when it's not going to work. 
All right. Very good. A nurse. Did we do that too? Yes, we did. Okay. A nurse is caring for an infant who's just returned from the PACU following cleft lip and palate repair. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Hmm. Packing. B. B. Because you wouldn't want to mess with the mouth. Like you wouldn't want to put a pacifier in it or put a tongue blade in. Very good. Very good. Don't put anything in the mouth, right? Let's look. Let's make sure we're right. But yes, upright position will facilitate drainage and prevent aspiration. Yes. Um, there you go. There's one thing on the cleft lip, cleft palate. A nurse is caring for a child who has Meckel's diverticulum. Which of the following manifestations should the nurse expect? Select all that apply. I'm going to have pain, abdominal pain, because that hurts really bad. Okay. They're going to have blood in the stools because they've got there that little. There you go. Here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Abdominal pain and mucus blood in the stools. Mm. Would they have fever? I don't know. Let's look. Let's look down and see. No, everybody's quiet. And I'm like, Ooh. okay, nope, no fever. So if you, so write this. So what you need to do is write each disease down and write those little key terms that we're, we're talking about. Abdominal pain is a manifestation of Meckel's diverticulum. Fever is a manifestation of appendicitis. Tricky. Uh, mucus and bloody stools are a manifestation of this. Uh, vomiting is appendicitis and shallow breathing or rapid shallow breathing is appendicitis. So do you see they're walking here between these two subjects right here? And so write those down. Okay. A nurse is teaching a parent of an infant about gastro, gastrointestinal reflux disease, which is GERD. Which of the following should the nurse include in the teaching? Select all that apply. That's what I think they're going to ask you about GERD. What are you going to teach your, teach your patient? Well, you always want to sit them up after you feed them, for sure. You don't okay. want to hurt. So D, for sure. Okay. okay. B, B, thick and formula with rice cereal, but I forgot to admit. That's good. That's good. I remember seeing offer, that. Offer them frequent meals would be good. Offer frequent feedings. Okay. Mm, okay. When would we use a bottle with a one-way valve? That's with the clip thing. Okay, and, and when would we use a wide base nipple for feedings? That's also with the palate or the clip injury. Yeah, when you guys get on your boards, you're going to be so good at this. You're going to be able to detect what you're seeing. So look, frequent feeding will assist in decreasing the amount of vomiting. Thick and formula will assist in decreasing the amount of vomiting episodes. Yay for you guys. Positioning the infant in an upright position. Uh, look, cleft lip and cleft palate were E and C. Very good. Very good. Okay. So this is what we're going to do. Hang on just a second. 